feel like God has a word for you. And I want to jump right on in. And I want to introduce you to this book called The Bible. And, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you for the month of August. You see, some of you are watching on your phones. And so when, when we read the scripture, you're not able to go to your, your Bible app because you're watching on your phone. Um, and so then you rely on Mario to display the scripture on the bottom of your screen, which is great. That's why we do it. But after today's message, you're going to want one of these. And so uh, for the next month or so, we are going to be talking about this. And there's nothing like getting a highlighter and highlighting things. In fact, this morning in my devo time, my devotion time, uh, I was reading the book of Isaiah that we're going to read. And I jumped to chapter 42. And in chapter 42, there was a highlight along with notes. And on the notes, it said, my promise for Mario Villasenor. 2012. And he and I know what that's all about, but I'm telling you, it reminded me of God's faithfulness. And so I want to, I want to challenge you to grab your Bible um, and go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to start reading at verse 27. I'm going to give you some time. And in a few moments, my wife is going to come up and we're going to take communion. And so if you haven't gotten that ready, uh, just run to your fridge, grab whatever that you can find if you're not prepared. Nicole Hernandez, give her a call or a text. She might be able to go to your house or Sonia Valdez as well. Pastor Sabrina's here in the house. So you might want to run here real quick and grab a cup. Um, but uh, get ready for that. We're going to have a really special moment here at the end, okay? Isaiah chapter 40, um, verse 27. I'm going to pray and then we'll read. God, for the next few moments, I pray you'd give me the mind of Christ. I pray that you would show me what, what these viewers need, not what the nine o'clock needed, not what our noon crowd is going to need, but what our 1030 group needs. And I pray that this would be prophetic and it would be on time, and it would be exactly what people need for this moment. And Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all my fears, all my anxiousness. Lord, I surrender all to you today. Thank you for being a good, good savior. I love you, Lord, and thank you for reaching into every person's home right now and being right next to them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, are you ready, folks? All right, Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm going to start reading at verse 27, okay? All right, watch this. Whoa, I'm in Jeremiah. Why am I in Jeremiah? All right, here we go. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Now, here's 31. It's the famous one that many people know, all right? But those who hope in the Lord, another translation will say wait. Those who wait or those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Man, let, let me tell you, this really, this last part really speaks to me. They, they will soar on wings like eagles. Hmm. Um. We entered 2020 with this great hope that this, is, this was going to be the year where Sendero soars on wings. I mean, we had systems in place. We had our structures in place. We had our staff in place. January, we had a uh, week-long series of meetings with everyone that was involved in ministry, and and we had goals. I mean, this was going to be the year that we reached 1,000 per week. We were going to win 400 souls uh, at our altar this year. I mean, we we had plans. We hired a company to come and analyze our finances, and we, we we hired another company to come and draw expansion plans. And this was going to be the year where we were going to soar on wings. And then March hit. And COVID came. And we got quarantined. And at first, it was 
it was okay. I mean, we were doing online church and we were set up already for it and, and, and we, were, we were okay. We were ready for this challenge because we thought it was gonna be a month or two, maybe July, but now we are heading into month six and it feels like those wings have been clipped. Come on, if you know what I'm talking about, I want you to write amen in that chat window. And so the promise is we'll soar on wings like eagles, but what do you do when those wings have been cut off or they've been tied together? You know, the last three weeks, Mary and Maddie and I spent a lot of time traveling. Um, we went down into Northern California. We went to the, to the uh, California coast. Um, and then we went to the Oregon coast and spent some time there. And we did a lot of driving, and I purposely wanted to drive just to, um, just to be able to process life right now. And we listened to a lot of podcasts of, of church, for church growth, uh, for personal growth. And, and then, you know, on satellite radio, you have Fox News, you have CNN News. And isn't it so interesting that you can have one issue and one set of people think a certain way, and another set of people think a certain way about the same thing, and they hate each other because they disagree with each other. And if you aren't careful, this can get inside of you. And you can become cynical as you hear all the media and local government and national government. Uh, you can hear those leaders speak about protests and riots and injustice and police reform and the economy and unemployment and schools, whether they should reopen or not. And do masks work or don't they work? And COVID-19 and all these vaccines that supposedly aren't working and hydrochloroquine and all that stuff. And, and you can become very opinionated and very negative. You know, as I already shared, I've been off of social, social media now for almost a month, and I, I feel kind of cleansed. Um, and, but I also feel disconnected. Um, and there is no doubt, there is no doubt. In fact, yesterday, several texts, I hope you're off of vacation but I want to let you know, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, oh, 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 I'm ready to preach. There's no doubt that as we enter those six months of not gathering, there have been spiritual casualties. In our nation, suicide is up. Divorce is up. Domestic violence is increasing. Alcohol sales are setting records. Drug use has increased. I, I got to spend some time with somebody this week that said, it's been, it's been hard, Pastor, and my go-to, and, and he told me what his go-to was to deal with what he's going through, and it wasn't a good thing. You see, unemployment is at an all-time record, and our government leaders can't even come together to figure out what kind of stimulus they should give this country. You see, not only that, but inside the church, people are dying. They're dying spiritually. They're walking away. Church viewership is way down, not just for Sendero, but all over this country. What was once a novelty and exciting becomes, ah, I got other things to do. And when church viewership is down, then it connects to giving because giving is down. And during normal times, I want you to think about this, okay? Attendance and giving are usually the, the, the very first two things that go when someone decides to walk away from Jesus. When someone decides, I'm not gonna be faithful and I'm gonna walk away, the very first thing that is affected is their attendance and then their giving. And there are signs that, that people are losing their faith or backing away from faithfulness. And here's the thing, y'all. We're not in normal times. So what is happening? I mean, I, I, I've often asked myself, uh, Mary and I ha have had some very candid conversations where, where we've asked ourselves, man, where are the prophets of God at? I mean, where are the men and women of God who are deeply connected to the spirit, who aren't complaining about having to wear a mask, but are speaking hope and direction and have a thus saith the Lord in their spirit? Where are those people at? 
And by the way, those people don't have to be the pastors and their staff. That's everyday people who are connected to the Holy Ghost. Where are those people? Where are the intercessors? Why aren't they crying out on behalf of God's people? But then I ask myself this question. Could it be that, that God is purposely silent right now? Like he hasn't left us. God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of sin you committed last night. God is with you. So it's not that he's left us, but could it be that he is purposely silent, waiting to see how we will respond to his silence? Because isn't it true, family, that we want God's intervention? Isn't it true that we want God to give us our normal back? I mean, I want my normal back. I, I, I want to watch the Seattle Seahawks win the Super Bowl this season. That's normal for me, right? I want my normal back. I, I want God to heal our land and to forever remove the memory of coronavirus, not because necessarily I want our nation to be better, but because I have been personally affected and I can't shop like normal. Now, to be fair, and my wife knows this, I'm an, I'm an eBay, Amazon guy, so that didn't get affected. <laughs> but Marshall's got affected. I, 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 I want I, I, I want to go to Rock Top whenever I want, how I want, and I can't anymore. I, I want, I, believe it or not, I want a hot chicken salad from Michael's on the Lake right now in their restaurant with everybody sitting right next to me, six inches away from me. I want my normal back. And we can't do those things. We have to wear masks and we can't come to church. But I wonder, folks, I wonder if I want, if I and you and us and we, I wonder if we want God to move out of selfishness, out of the fact that I've been affected that I, me, Mikey, that I've been affected. That's why I want God to move. Because I want to do what I want. And now I'm being told what I can do and what I can't do and who I can have in this church and who I can't have in this church. But God's not answering my cry right now. So here we are with lost hope. Here we are frustrated that our lives have been interrupted with no end in sight, folks. We don't know when we're going to gather. With the discomfort of sickness and death, I don't know if you've lost anybody during this time, or lost wages and lost unemployment, and, 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 and because we are frustrated and maybe angry, we're not praying as much, because how can I pray when I'm mad? Come on, say amen, or, or word, or well, or something in that chat window I can see in front of me, because I can't pray when I've messed up. How can, I, how can I dare pray after I've said something I shouldn't say? And all of a sudden, I'm falling away more, and I'm talking like I shouldn't talk more, so I pray less because I feel too guilty to pray. And now I'm falling back into mentalities and behaviors that I had walked away from last year. And now I'm back into those things again. I'm saying things that I shouldn't say. I'm starting to see things on my phone I shouldn't see. I'm, I'm starting to flirt like I shouldn't be flirting. I, I, I'm starting to do things that I shouldn't be doing. I was doing them in the past, but I gave them up. But now, here I am. And now I don't even know if I want to go back to church when it reopens. All right, now I got your attention. And your spiritual father is here to speak. And I want to introduce you to a man, a young man named Isaiah. His name means Yahweh is salvation. He, he's often called, I first heard this by uh, Pastor T.D. Jakes, he's the eagle-eyed prophet because he prophesied about events and circumstances that wouldn't happen until 200 to 700 years in the future. And he came from a royal family. He was destined for riches and royalty, but God called him out of that comfort to accept a difficult calling of prophesying judgment over the people of God, the nation of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. A people, folks, that forgot about God. 
They forgot about his miracles. They forgot about his salvation. They forgot about how he had opened up the Red Sea and their ancestors crossed on dry ground. They forgot about the Ark of the Covenant. They forgot about David and his Psalms. They had forgotten about their heritage and their history. And they forgot about their future and the promises of God. And they refused to put away idols. And they adopted the secular culture all around them. And they walked away from faith. And Isaiah, the very first thing that God tells him to prophesy, folks, is a very difficult thing. (laughs) And you don't have to get there. I I think we'll have it. But it's Isaiah chapter 1. Look at the very first things that God tells him to say. He says, hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children of uh, given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. I want you to notice that he compares them to animals. He says, donkeys know their master, oxen know their master, but my people have forgotten their father. And oxen move when their master tells them to move, but you won't move when I tell you to move. Tang. That, that's, that's in your face. That's in my face. And he says, man, I brought you up. I mean, anybody who has kids who are older now that have rebelled, you know exactly the feeling that God has. The, the, the disruption of having given your all to your children and as they're older, they turn their back on you. I mean, what, what a way to start a ministry telling people that animals are more, more obedient than them. That's a great way to get fired from a pastor position. I mean, in Spanish, it's going to be hard for me because it's going to say, ustedes güeyes. <laughs> and if you don't know Spanish, it's okay. You don't need to know that word, but it's not a, necessarily a great word. Marta, why are you laughing, Marta? Okay. All right. Now watch this. For 39 chapters and for several years, due to rebellion, due to idolatry, the lack of spiritual convictions, the lack of a moral code, Isaiah pronounces judgment upon God's children. And things just kept getting worse because people had decided to walk away. And can I tell you something? When you walk away from relationship with God, you lose the benefits of that relationship. You lose the covering and protection that that relationship provides. I shared this at the nine and I'll share it again. My, my sister and her family have been here all summer long. They've been very adventurous. They've had some great times, but I had told my sister, before you leave, you and I need to have a serious talk with our parents about the future. And so last night, I got to spend a couple hours with my sister and my mom and dad and her two no- nosy kids that we had to kick out because they were just being very nosy. And Matthew and Natalie, if you're watching, don't be mad at me, I'll talk to you in a bit. All right. And we talked about the future of my parents. They're getting older. And I told them, Mom, Dad, I don't want to be caught off surprise if something were to happen. What are your wishes? What do you want? And we began to speak about the future. Now, here's the thing is, I'm close to my mom and dad. We have great relationships. When I walk into my parents' house, I can go straight to the fridge. My dad bought a, an old Coke machine from the 60s, and they've been filling that thing with those bottles from Mexico, those Coke bottles from Mexico. And, and I go in there, and I grab as many as I want while I'm sitting there talking. I don't need to ask permission. I just go. Why? Because those are benefits of relationship. Now, if I walk away from my dad and turn my back on him, I'm still his son, but I don't get the benefits of relationship. So I'm, I still carry sonship. I'm still Mike Alvarado's son, but I don't have the benefits of walking into his home and enjoying what he's provided for, even as an older man now. And so the way it is in the natural, it is in the spiritual. You walk away from Jesus, you are still a son, but you've lost the benefits of that relationship. You lose the covering. 
You lose the peace. You lose the joy. You lose the conviction that Abba's way is the best way. You lose that. That's why the Proverbs write, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. This is exactly what happened to Judah and Jerusalem. And I'm afraid, folks, that it's happening to many saints today, many believers, many, many Christians who were on fire in January and February and were ready to soar on wings like eagles. But today, they've stopped watching church. They've stopped reading their scripture. They've stopped praying. They've stopped gathering. They've taken up old friendships, doing things that they had walked away from because their wings had been clipped. And maybe I have failed you as a pastor. Can I get closer, Vithya? Can I get closer or is this going to be too? I want you to see all my marks on my face. Maybe, maybe I've failed you as a pastor. Because maybe I've taught you to rely too much on the Sunday show. On the great worship and the lights. And on the preaching. And you've relied too much on that so that you, le you left with a Sunday high, but crawling on Saturday night because you did nothing with the word that you received on Sunday. I want to talk to you about that because that's a problem in America. That's a problem with our church today. Folks, there's no way to avoid what's going on. We're all in it together. But why is it that some are flourishing spiritually and others are not? And so for 39 chapters, Isaiah, gloom and doom and judgment with just small windows of hope. But something happens that's very interesting in chapter 40. The message changed from judgment to mercy. God changed his message from despair to grace and from hostility to hope. It's like a shift happened. Like God said, all right, they paid the price. Now I'm ready to bless them and manifest myself to them. And so God tells this young prophet Isaiah, comfort my people, baby boy. Tell Jerusalem that redemption is coming. And it's here that Isaiah speaks then about John the Baptist, who 700 years later would prepare the way for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And Isaiah says, cry out and tell the people that my word stands the test of time. My word endures forever. What I say will always come to pass. Isaiah reminds the people that I'm their shepherd, that I'm going to take care of them and I'm going to protect them. I carry them close to my heart. Though they have walked away, I'm a covenant keeping God and they can break the covenant all they want. I will never break my covenant. I'm with them. Isaiah, I want you to remind them of my greatness and my wisdom, that I'm the one that created the circle of the earth, that I'm the one that created all the stars and put their, put their uh, stars in their places and named them by names. I know all about the stars and the hosts of heaven, and I know all about my people. Not one thing is hidden from my sight. Ah, he knows us. You see, the creator of something always knows everything about his creation. You see, it's so easy during this time, folks, to think that we've been forgotten. I haven't gotten the text message. I haven't gotten the phone call. I haven't been asked to serve. It's so easy to fall back, easy to allow things back into our lives that at one time we had removed because we feel forgotten, forsaken, and we don't have a desire to grow. Can I get an amen in that chat window? Because I'm, by the way, I'm preaching to myself. And this is what the people of God were feeling as Isaiah was prophesying and exactly how many people feel today. I'm forgotten, I'm forsaken. My cause has been disregarded. Like nobody cares about what I'm going through. And it causes, it causes us to wanna just walk away from relationship with God. And then the exciting happens in verse 27. Because it's like, well, not, it, it was that God heard them. God hears when I complain. And there's a couple people in this room that know how much I've been complaining lately. Just complaining that I got nothing left in the tank. 
Like, God, after 19 years of ministry, what else can I do here, God? And Isaiah speaks to that. And God uses him to say, why do you complain? And insert your name there. Why do you say, insert your name there, my way is hidden from the Lord and my cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, haven't you heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and earth. He will not grow tired or weary. Oh, the psalmist says that he doesn't slumber, that he doesn't sleep, that God watches over us night and day. His understanding no one can fathom. I mean, how can we fathom the things that God, the complexities of who I am? I don't even understand myself, but God does. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary and young people stumble and fall. But those who hope, those who wait in the Lord will renew their strength. What great news. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired or grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I want you to pay attention to verse 31 though. Again, it speaks about returning to soar with wings. That's a return to vision and joy and power and strength and walking in your calling, God wants us all to soar on wings like eagles. That's what we've been destined to do. But listen, before you can be trusted to soar with wings, you've got to be willing to wait. You see, in the, in the Hebrew, the word hope and wait are the same word. It means to actively, now, now when we think of waiting in our culture, we're thinking of sitting down, waiting while you're Wanting to get into a restaurant, you get on a waiting list and you're waiting and you're mad that they're taking so long. And all you can do is sit there, be on your phone, get angry. Wait a minute, we were in there before they were. Have anybody ever, has anybody ever done that? I know Pastor Juan has. He and I together, we're like, man, we, we. <laughs> but see, in Hebrew, waiting isn't sitting for something to happen. It's actually an active word that means that I will pursue God with great expectation that he's going to move on my behalf. And while I wait, I pursue. It's not sitting in silence or standing in frustration. It's arms wide open saying, you are going to give me victory because of, of my covenant relationship with you. And it may not happen today, and it might not happen tomorrow, but while I wait, I serve. While I wait, I pray. While I wait, I love. While I wait, I give. While I wait, I read. While I wait, I worship. While I'll wait, I'll be faithful. You see, that kind of waiting is rooted in the character of God. Not in my character, because my character fails. But it's rooted in the faithfulness of the character of God, his power, his love. He's not moved by circumstances. So hoping and waiting do require patience, but they're not indifferent. They are active. It's almost like a holy dissatisfaction, an understanding that God has more to give. Despite my weariness and tiredness and failures and frailty, despite my wavering, God is faithful. And if I eagerly wait and hope on him, he's going to come through for me. I know it because I've seen him do it for others, so he's got to do it for me because my God is just. He's just. Unfortunately, many get lost in the waiting. They get lost in the waiting because they don't understand what waiting really means. So many lose their way, their faith, their fight in the waiting. But let me tell you that it's in the waiting where we develop something called spiritual roots. And that's a spiritual connection that you dig down deep within your spirit and soul that is anchored to the cross of Calvary and it's anchored to God's great love that though I want to run away and quit, I won't because I'm rooted. In the New Testament, we'll talk about being rooted and grounded in Christ. You see, I've entitled this series that we'll be doing in August called Roots and Wings. And Pastor Freddie is going to open a restaurant, him and Brianna, and Aria will be the chef. And 
roots and wings. I mean, we're going to drink root beer, we're going to read scripture and eat a bunch of wings. Come on, somebody. Doesn't that sound great? Roots and wings. I hear somebody speaking in tongues somewhere. Amen? Roots and wings. You see, we, we need both of them. We need to dig roots deep and we need to have wings to accomplish the mission of God, the mandate of heaven on our lives. You see, soaring with wings like eagles mean that when storms come, we can soar above them. We can see miles away. We can, we can be strong and not let the contrary wind hold us back, doing what God has called us to do. But listen, family, we can't have wings until we're grounded, until we're rooted. And I know that doesn't sound right, but I promise you, you see, when I have roots, God can trust me with wings. When I, when I have roots, God can trust me that when he gives me those wings, I'm not going to fly away somewhere and do something stupid with them. I'm going to stay rooted. I'm going to stay grounded because I know God. I know him. I know his character. I know he loves me. I know I'm not alone. And that's being rooted. You see, we need, we need both. It's interesting. And, and Layla, come on up. Last week, um, now the last three Sundays, we didn't watch service. We stayed away. But Pastor Sabrina told us that she was going to be preaching about our rafting trip a couple, couple weeks ago. And she shared it. My family did a rafting trip. And, and, and she had a raft here and she illustrated it. But I want to share one thing. It stuck out to me. Um, our guide was this little girl. And she seemed like she was 12. And I tell you, that girl was stronger than strong. And she sat at the back of the raft. And she told us before we got into the rough waters, she says, you're going to hear me say this. Dig deep. And when I tell you to dig deep, you have to give me your all and you've got to get your oar and you need to put it deep in the water and push back so that we can move forward. So when you hear me say that, you got to dig deep if we're going to survive this. And when she said that, we kind of freaked out. Like, what do you mean survive? <laughs> and I thought it was going to be just this little, you know, you know, little pond, yeah, this little, uh, no, 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 no. Th this, folks, if you see pics, I mean, there, there was one wave that not, not even the guide saw. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 200 under your business pounds. And, and this wave knocked me from one side of the raft into my sister and almost knocked her over. And our guide, and at first I'm like, dang, I was, I'm weak. And my, my sister-in-law, my, the guide said, hey, Mike, don't worry. I didn't even see that one coming. That one would have knocked everybody off. But here's the point. We start getting into the rough waters. And out of nowhere, our guide screams, dig deep. I need you to dig deep. And we weren't doing it. And she says, hey, I need you to give me your all right now. I need you to dig deep. Each of you, dig, 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 dig deep. Because she knew that the only way we were going to get beyond that wave and beyond that rapid is if we dug deep. And I'm here to tell you, family, to prophesy to you, some of you have stopped digging deep. You've allowed everything to take, to take your heart out. And you ha you're not digging deep. And so now you don't know how you're going to pay your bills and you're angry. Or you, you don't know how much more to love your wife. Or, you, or you, you don't know how much more you can handle. But you're not digging deep. I'll be honest with you. As we were digging deep, we were scared. And then on my side was, was me and my daughter. And so my daughter's 12 and she was laughing most of the time and her oar was hitting me most of the time. So guess what? 
I had to dig for two of us. Leader, where are you, leader? Because as leaders, sometimes we got to dig for others. Sometimes we need to pick that phone up and we need to dig. We need to dig. We, we, we need to grow. We need to grow roots. You see, if you aren't willing to dig deep, then you're going to get blown away by this quarantine, by the masks, by the loneliness of it all. If you haven't already blown it, you're headed that way. If you can't stand in your faith when we can't gather, then you'll never be able to soar on wings when we come back. Listen to me, family. I want to look back on 2020 and say, though he slay me, I trust him. I, I do not, listen to me, I do not want to look back on 2020 with regret. We got five months, y'all, five months left in this calendar year. And many people, unfortunately, are going to have to rebuild their faith in 2021 when Sundays can come back, if they can. I don't want to do that. I, I want to be able to say Sendero looks back on 2020 and we were faithful and we were strong so that when we can gather, we can look back with no regret and say we did what God asked of us and now let's soar with wings. Listen, but we got to grow roots. And so for the next few weeks, that's what you're going to hear this preacher talk about and other teachers. Roots like spiritual discipline such as prayer and meditation, fasting, reading the word of God, memorizing the word of God so that it gets in our hearts. Psalms 119, 11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I would not sin against you. Disciplines like worshiping, disciplines like serving. If you don't know it, quarantine has not stopped us from doing ministry. COVID cannot stop us from doing ministry. Though we're not getting together on Sundays, ministry is still happening. There are still opportunities for you to serve. We need so much that I don't have enough time to tell you. Ask. Roots, like, like core convictions. That it's not a matter of sin and if I can do it or can't do it. It's my core conviction. This is how I was raised. This is how I honor people. Though they don't deserve it, I will honor. I will live with core convictions and a moral code and a moral compass and core values. Those are roots. Roots like dying to self carrying your cross and following Jesus. I know, I know we don't want to hear those things right now, but those are the roots that are going to sustain you during this season. I can't walk away from Jesus because he gave his blood for me. I can't, I can't turn my back on him. The temptation has been there, folks. The temptation to walk away from everything has been there during COVID. But why am I here this morning? Because I'm rooted. I'm not perfect. I make my mistakes. I have my temptations. But I'm rooted. And when I'm rooted, I don't give up on the call of God. Listen to me. Though gathering has been taken from us, we can still flourish because of our root system that goes beyond what others can see. It's fed by living water. Jesus said this in John 7, 38. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You're in the word and rivers of living water just bubble up and they come out of you. And so for the next few weeks, family, we're gonna talk about roots. We'll get to wings. And maybe we'll even have a hot wing party that Sunday. Huh? Huh? And, and maybe we'll have, oh, maybe we'll have a hot wing drive through service. All right, all right. But before we do that, we gotta get back to offering because you need to give in order for us to buy that stuff. We'll get to the wings and the hot wings. He, somebody said buffalo. Pastor Freddie said buffalo. We like the, what kind do we like? The, the lemon pepper. We like the lemon pepper ones. Chico's has great wings, by the way. We, we think of pizza. 
which is great. Oh, Chico's pizza. All right, let's get back to scripture. We'll be looking at, at roots. And not only will we be looking at, at healthy spiritual roots, but we'll be looking at bitter roots, roots of hatred, strife, that cause us to push people away, that cause us to be angry with people and hold grudges. It's gonna get real, y'all. And I'm excited for it. And so we'll look at developing while we're waiting. And I really feel like there's an urgency in my spirit that we gotta regroup and do this family. I don't wanna have to rebuild in 2021. Let's rebuild right now. Because the moment the coronavirus can be dealt with the right way, I wanna run.